Welcome to Journey Church. Our church exists to help people find God, experience freedom, discover their purpose, and make a difference. If you have any questions about Journey Church, please visit us at ourjourney.tv. Welcome home. Welcome to Journey Church. So today we're going to talk a, a different uh, approach on experiencing God. This one is experiencing God in the marketplace. And what I mean by that, I'm talking about anytime you're in the public, anytime you're out on the town, and even time you're, anytime that you're at work, you could experience God. Now, the good thing is we're not just talking about how you could experience God, but we're also talking about how you could help others experience God. That's the main thing. What a blessing to hear about this. But even more, just to put it in action. Everybody here has a job, right? Most of us do. Most of us. There's nothing better than to have a job that you actually enjoy doing. Nothing better. Anybody here say that they, could, they actually can relate to the messages that's been, been being told? Anybody can say, hey, they've experienced God in similar ways? I'm glad. I'm glad. Well, here's one more. I want you to know that I believe that any activity God could do, he could do it past this building, he could do it between Sundays. There are some people who actually think God only works on Sundays. And they think they employ pastors that only work on Sundays. And that's just not true. I know our pastor is one of the hardest working people I've ever met. And uh, he exhausts me just watching him work. And he's done some amazing job in this building. I mean, just really, everything you see here is a vision that God's given him. But I'm going to tell you, his work goes far beyond this church building. But what he's teaching is an example that we should follow, that our work goes way beyond this building. Our work is more than just this church is building, this church is Sunday and Wednesdays, and even it's more than your life group. Your life group really only meets once a month, some of them twice a month, but... That's a great connection between those Sundays. But actually, one of the best ways you can implement your life in somebody else's and implement what God's doing in your life is in the workplace. It's the best way. Do you know that God is in the saving business? So who needs saved? I would say it's the lost, wouldn't you? Well, they ain't here. They're not found. So where are the lost? They're not in this building, which means we got work to do outside of here. Our best place to implement our workforce for God is outside this building. Like this, uh, Matthew 16, 18 is this. Jesus says to Peter, and you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Now, if you've been listening to this series at all, you'll, you'll see that Dr. Dale used this. So did Mr. Brent. This has actually been a common theme for a few messages. But I like this because Jesus asked, and who do they say that I am? That's what he does before. And then after that, he says, all right, well, Peter, then who do you say that I am? And then when Jesus answered, he goes, well, there you go. That's your foundation. He's not saying, all right, Jesus, right here, build a church. Right here, you know, on this little rock right here, right there's your cornerstone. Let's go ahead and build a building. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is that on the revelation of who Christ is, when God became real to you in that moment, that is when you build your foundation on how you're going to live your life. Now, who was Peter? We know Peter was just a disciple, right? But he's actually more than that. He had a profession. Peter was a fisherman. He's a fisherman. So no doubt, too, not only was he a fisherman, he's a businessman as well because he didn't just fish for himself. Nobody's hauling in a whole net full of fish for a buffet for themselves. I'm going to tell you that. And if Jesus is helping him out and he said, hey, throw that net on the other side and you're going to bring in more than your boat can hold, that's not for one fish fry. All right? So what did he do? He had to be selling fish or at least giving it away or delivering it to a market. He was a businessman, Right? Jesus uses businessmen. I think it's really important that he does because the marketplace is the best place to interact with others. The marketplace is an even playing field. Everybody's going to get something. He didn't say, Peter, now stop fishing and forget all you know about fishing and then go bank a building. That's not what he said. What he is saying, now that you've experienced the revelation of who God is, 
Now go and share this experience with others. The good thing about Jesus is he had something that we have a very little piece of today. He's saying, now go and share that experience with others. But he also says, hey, I'm going to walk with you. Just stick with me. Now, we don't have Jesus walking with us hand in hand where we could see him. But we come to this building to learn how to do that. And then we got all week to practice it. All week to practice it. And you know what happens, man, if you feel like, man, you know what? Well, I did it Monday and Tuesday, but, man, I'm starting to fall off. Okay, well, Wednesday, come in here, learn again. Okay? And then, you know, every now and then reach out to a brother or sister, say, hey, uh, I don't forget, how do we do this? Or what did they say on Sunday? Or what did they say on Wednesday? Or how do I go back and look that up? That's one thing I do like about technology we have now is you could always go back and look it up. Always. This lines up with my favorite verse of the Bible. My favorite verse of the Bible is Galatians 5.13. It's, it's my absolute favorite, favorite. It says, brothers and sisters, those of you who are called to be free. Now, when it says brothers and sisters, who are you talking about? The people in the church. And he says, those of you who are called to be free, who's that? Everybody in the church. All right, it says, do not use your freedom to indulge the things of the flesh, but rather use your freedom to set others free. That's what it's for. So he's saying, hey, look, I've given you this. I've given you the experience. I've held your hand. Now go and do it. And what you do can be infectious. What you do can make a difference in somebody else's life. That's really what he's saying. Your experience with God may, the th be, may be the one thing that leads others to Christ. It may be. If you can look in the mirror and you see you, that's fine. But if you look in the mirror every day and you see a little bit more of Jesus... You're doing things because ultimately that's who you're trying to reflect. Ultimately, I mean, you got a competition every day with yourself on it. Can you outdo who you was yesterday? Can you be more and more like Christ? If you can, somebody's watching. If the church is for the saved, then we must learn how to go and implement God's plan because the work of the church is done best in the workforce. We can play with each other here and practice with each other here, but we're all saved. We're all saved. Now we can grow in strength and we can, we can do that stuff. We're not growing in numbers by recycling this message amongst ourselves. This is training ground for you to go and implement it somewhere else. That's what it's for. The workforce, the field, that's what it is. Now, the good news is some of us in here are employees, but there's also employers. So don't think that it's just for employees to share the word. The people at the top could do it too. And actually the people at the top have the best advantage to do it. You have the ability to make a difference wherever you are. And our job is a perfect place to bring Jesus. You know, even if you don't speak the words of revelation, even if you don't have to quote scripture at your work, did you know that your actions can express everything you just learned? And actually, your actions speak louder than your voice. The quote I love, man, I just, uh, Dr. Dale used it too. I love it. It says, go and preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. If your boss tells you to do something, you're like, that already spoke louder than anything you had to say. You know, the Bible has a lot to say about that, about being a good employee. And the good, bad thing about that is the person you're training is seeing how you react. And you're just setting up a sour workforce. And then you wonder why you hate your job. You can bring joy and you can bring peace and you can bring hope to a workplace and make your job a little piece of heaven. Wherever you are, let God be known through you. Through you. It doesn't matter where you are. And, and know this, you don't even have to direct it towards nobody. Sometimes it's kind of like light. All these light bulbs here have a direction. They're pointing down. But for some reason, light went sideways as well. That's how our lives are supposed to be done too. We live our life like this, but we have the ability to affect like this. That's how it's supposed to be. Let me tell you a story about that. Isaac and I, we're just having a good time one day and uh, went over. This is when... Isaac had been praying, and I, and I advise y'all to follow this advice. If you're going to ask somebody to mentor, you'd be praying about it. So pray, he was praying that, that I would mentor him, which my job now then would be, well, I need to pray if I need to be the guy to mentor him. 
And so when we come to that conclusion that, yes, hey, this is a good idea. I believe God wants me to mentor you and you, and you believe God wants me to mentor you, then, then it's a good time to go ahead and have this conversation. So we, me and him, we meet up at one of the uh, one of these local places to eat, and we're just having a good time. We're eating, and the whole time I'm talking to Isaac about what it takes to actually be mentored, uh, what I expect from him, and what he should expect to me from me. We're talking about just our godly walks in life. I'm just general stuff, casual conversation, and uh, prayed over our food, prayed over each other. Just, I mean, just great conversation. I had no idea. We couldn't even tell you who was around us. It didn't matter. We did, I can't even tell you what we ate. It did not matter. What mattered was me and him was focused on each other, and God was in the middle of our conversation. All of a sudden, there's an Amish brother got up and walked over to us. And he said, man, I've never, ever, ever heard anybody talk like that, and especially not in public. And he had his two sons with him. He said, I wish I had somebody talking to me that way so I could tell my sons these things. And it was just amazing. Look, and we didn't do it for show because I, I couldn't even tell them brothers was there. If you'll be who you're supposed to be, it'll bleed off onto other people. You could set the atmosphere and you don't even have to know it because understand this, if God is there and two people are there, he's in the midst, okay? And it had nothing to do with us. We was just doing what we are supposed to be doing. But that's just in the public. That's just in a restaurant. You know what I'm saying? That's just how it's supposed to be. Just being yourself in public, sharing the word of God by your conversation. These men witnessed something way healthier than the food they was eating. I promise you that. Way healthier. Even in the worst of circumstances, you can use your mannerisms to preach louder than your words. Even in the worst. So I'm going to tell you the worst. I'm a big foodie, so I, I love restaurants. I go to restaurants, and I critique the mess out of restaurants. I, I just love food. And uh, went to this restaurant, took my son, took my stepson. We was ready to have a great brunch. They started serving brunch. So I was excited about it. And uh, they asked us what we wanted to drink, and um, they had this strawberry lemonade. And it just looked great on the little picture. So I was like, I want to get that because it had strawberries on the top and had a little uh, little toothpick umbrella. I mean, they really doctored it up, you know. And it was, it was very foo-foo for a man to drink. But I was like, I'm going for it. As long as the umbrella wasn't pink, I was good. And it was a yellow one, by the way. So anyway, they bring it back to me, and I'm, we're having a casual conversation and all that ice is glistening over the top. And I'm like, I want to eat this strawberry. You know, it's just really good. And I throw that strawberry right in my mouth. And I bit down, cut my mouth all to pieces. It wasn't ice. It was broken glass. So I got a mouthful of blood. It's nasty. Now I'm just like, hold my mouth. I don't know what to do. My, my sons are looking at me. And, and uh, I'm trying my best not to hulk out on these people. Because I could feel the blood bo boiling up to my ears. Now, I know for facts, that's not the waitress's fault. She didn't make that drink for me, you know. So I spit that out, get the glass out. I call the waitress back, and I say, hey, I don't know what to say, uh, but this thing has broken glass in it. And her eyes got big. She said, oh, I'm so sorry. I said, it's no problem, but you need to tell the kitchen something's not right. She said, all right, I'll send a manager to you. I said, yes, please do. So she goes, and she goes back in the kitchen. She comes back probably about 15 minutes later. You know they're scared to death right now. So she comes back and she said, oh, I'm so sorry, but we found the problem. Uh, there was a glass that broke and it fell on the fruit. We got all that stuff cleaned up. Yeah. Don't worry, your appetizers are comped. I was like, well, okay. I was still upset, but like I said, that's not her fault. I said, is your manager coming? She said, she said, I don't think she wants to talk to you. So now I'm mad, but like I said, that's not her fault. And I said, well, okay. I said, just bring me some water with no ice. I thought that was safer, you know. So I get that. My, my kids are like, man, Dad, what are you going to do? What you? And I was like, it's, it'll be all right. So anyway, they bring my stuff. Then we get our meal, eat our meal. I'm still upset. And uh, finally get done. And the woman comes over and she brings me the tick, ticket. The manager still has not shown up. She brings me the ticket. We've been there over an hour and a half. And uh, on there is my full bill. She didn't comp anything. And I said, I said, uh, hey, is this bill correct? She said, yeah, my manager's not going to let me take stuff off. I was like, okay. So I went ahead and paid her. Like I said, that's not her fault. So I gave her a tip. 
Then we got up and we left. And my sons was like blown away. But the thing is, even though I'm hurt and I'm mad, before I was ever hurt and mad, I'm a man of God. And if I'm going to be an ambassador for Christ, I better learn to represent God well wherever I go. That's what an ambassador does. So I did what I know best. No, no, do best. I paid my tab. I gave a tip. I told the woman, thank you. And I went outside and I called my wife and complained like crazy. <laughs> so my wife did the dirty work for me because she's awesome. She just called the corporate office and they said, don't worry, we'll take care of it. She just let it go. And we get a letter in the mail a couple weeks later and I'm like, yes, this is going to be great. And they gave us a 20% off card. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what's done. You still do your part. And that's what matters, all right? So whether it's a good situation or a bad situation, we are the ambassadors. And then the marketplace is the best place to be able to show God is real. Amen? What we're doing is learning how to act out our faith in public. But what we're really doing is showing that we could be emotionally healthy Christians wherever we go. Because if we can't, and we look like we're unstable, why is the church ever going to look good? Why is the church ever going to be healthy if we're not emotionally healthy? Someone is always watching to see how you react. Always. Let's go to another story. I had uh, Mike Henderson with me, had Pastor Vince, had my son. I think Chad was there too, I'm not sure. But anyway... We're doing these handrails on this house. And I had these handrails custom built because I was a contractor. And it took a couple weeks for him to come in. And I told the guy, I said, we'll, we'll put them on your house. His, house. his wife was extremely happy to get these handrails put in. And uh, I told her, I said, well, we'll put them in Saturday. But if it rains, I won't be here. And I'll see you Monday. She says, all right. So I was living in town at the time. Me and Pastor live less than a mile apart. The house we was going to work on was less than a mile from there. So all within two, mile, two miles apart. Saturday morning, I get up, it's raining like crazy. I called Pastor, hey, we're not going to work, work today. We'll do it Monday. I said, all right. Monday comes around. We go over to that house, and I knock on the door, and, and they're like three steps up. So I'm looking up at this woman like this, trying to tell her, hey, how you doing? We're here to put your handrails in. That woman is fighting mad. Eyes are shaking, ready to cuss me like a dog. And she says, you stay right here. I'm going to get my husband. And pastor's right behind me. I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so anyway, she goes back and she gets her husband. He comes in. And this dude, he already towers over me. He's like Brian, but maybe even he seemed like three feet taller, but he's only like an inch taller. But anyway, and he's on three steps up. So he really looks like a monster. And he's got these big old meat hook hands, man. And he, gets, he pokes me in the chest, which is the one thing I... I recommend nobody ever do. <laughs> I could take a cussing, but don't touch me. So he, he, he put, uh, pokes me in the chest and he says, you got some nerve coming here today. And I was like, what? So I just back up, you know, because I, I, I try my best to control the violence inside me. So I just backed up and I said, hey, I'm sorry, what's going on? He said, you told me that you would be here Saturday. I said, yeah, I told you if it wasn't raining, but it rained like crazy. And he said, it did not rain here. Well, I've seen it where it rains on one side of the road, not on the other. And it rained at my house, and I don't live but a mile away. And then Pastor, his eyes are big too, like, what are you going to do? And I said, hey, hey, brother, I'll tell you what. And I put my hand out there to shake it, which is not good for somebody to grab my hand when I'm mad. So I grab him, and I pull him to me. And I said, I just want you to know, I took our friendship for granted. I thought that when I said I wouldn't be here on this day that I would be here the next day that you understood what I said. Now, it's not my fault that it didn't rain at your house, but I promise you did it mine. And I'll tell you what, we're going to put these handrails in. It's going to be amazing. You're going to love them. And he said, you might, but I'm not going to pay you. And he said, I said, okay. I said, well, we'll go ahead and get them done there. And I popped them on the arm like that. I said, we'll get them done. I, I guarantee you, you're going to love them. You'll want to pay for them. And I walked off. And of course, me and Pastor sitting there, he goes, like, how'd you pull this off? We put the handrails in. We about got it done. They had this little bitty wiener dog, and they're out there walking around the yard, and his wife sees the handrail. She comes back, tells him. He walks up to me and said, hey, it looks good. Will. I'm going to get you a check right now. It could have all been different if I would have responded different because I have just as much flesh as that guy does. 
And the minute you're touched and you're cussed and you're being put in a bad spot and then told all the effort you put out, you're not going to get paid, you have a way to respond that could actually destroy your witness. But if God is God in church, to you, he's God in the marketplace too. So you got to learn how to walk out your faith because God will use your times of need to help others to experience God through you. I'll go to another story because there's good and bad and everything and you could use every bit of your good and bad for good. Amen? Every bit of it. Christmas time. As a contractor, it's feast or famine. Sometimes it's good money. Sometimes it's really bad money. Sometimes it's really, really good money. And sometimes you're like, how do I get help? We have one of those times. We needed help. Didn't have no money. It was coming up on Christmas time. And everything we had was paid for. That was great. But had no extra. So Christmas is really looking bleak. Now, me and my wife, we would normally don't do Christmas presents or birthday presents because we live on love. <laughs> But anyway, so it's getting close to Christmas. Now, the important thing was, was Addison. Addison was little. And so it was, I was like, I can't get mama a gift because I really don't have the money. And we done made an agreement. We're not getting gifts. That's great. But I want to make sure Addison could get her a gift. So me and Addison, I think Addison's maybe, what, six or seven years old. And we took off to uh, Clark's wife. I had a $100 bill that really wasn't needed to be spent. But I had it, and I was like, we're going to still get Mama something. So we took off. We went to Belk in Clarksville, and this woman was helping us. We went over to the perfume counter. We was getting Julius a, a gift. And I gave that woman that $100 bill to pay for it. She was super nice, helpful. She counted that money back to me and gave me back exactly $100. And uh, I looked at that. I was like, this is crazy. I gave her 100 She gave me 100 back. Now, I gave her a $100 bill. She gave me a bunch of change, you know, but it's still equal to 100 bucks. And I looked at her, I said, hey, uh, I said, ma'am, you gave me the wrong change. She said, no, I didn't. I gave you back exactly $100. I said, no, I know exactly what you gave me, but you gave me back $100. She said, I know. I said, no, you don't understand. That means I did not pay for this. And that woman swelled up with tears immediately, and she started crying. She said, that would have been my third time this week doing that, and I would have lost my job. And she just starts bawling, and she says, thank you so much. And uh, she got my change right. And then she looks over at Addison, which was a great teaching moment for her. She said, your daddy's a good man. Most people wouldn't do that. And so she took the time and went by and took this little gift bag. And she got all them little perfume samples and makeup samples and put it in a bag just to give to Addison. You have no idea what your witness will do to people, just being honest. Most people are like, man, it's my lucky day. Look at this. God bless me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You have no idea you just got your money cursed. Because we're ambassadors, we should represent well. And the marketplace is the best place to do it. And because I've had an experience and an encounter with God, I know what happens to my money. And I know that God can replace it if I just stay true to his word. But I also know that God can make a difference in her life if I'm honest. So it worked out. You must decide if the public is an opportunity or an obstacle. You must decide that. If we believe we are here for a purpose, then why do we not extend that purpose beyond the four walls of the church? Our job is an excellent place to practice our faith, especially if you're a business, business owner. Good thing about a business owner like I am, like so many others are, we have employees, we have clientele, we do advertising, and we have connections to other businesses. That's a big field of influence right there. And you could influence a lot of people. You know, business owners could actually say, hey, we'll have a Bible study. You know what? We're going to start off every morning with a prayer, and can't nobody say nothing about it. You own it. You own it. Business-minded people are highly influential and connective. And because they interact with so many people from all walks of life, they connect easier and interdenominationally. A businessman only sees green. They don't care what church you go to. Does your Benjamin look like mine? That's all that matters. And I could be kind and nice to you because I know your money spends. But at the same token, if I say, hey, I know the God that's greater than that money, 
and I could extend love to you and I could extend my hands to you and I could actually say, hey, look, we can make the world a better place. It works better. And I don't care what denomination you're from because I, I think we all should be men and women of God. The thing is, churches have done a really good job to make cul-de-sacs that collect neighbors. But Christian business people make bridges that connect neighbors. It's good to have a Christian business. Al McVeigh has one, does a good job with it. And he's connecting a world bigger than we know because a lot of us don't know that kind of business. The oil field, the gas field, that's a big business. I mean, he's, he connected me to a lot of people in this outside areas. I didn't know, I thought sunlight only went so far, but he showed me new places where it reaches. And there's some stuff out there. There's people out there that need to be connected with, and a business owner could do that. Business people have to advertise to attract customers, and they soon realize the best business, business model you could have is one that's just authentic. That's the best business model you could have is just be authentic. What the world is hungry for is something real. That's what it is, something real. When you're real and you're relatable, that's the best way you could be. Business owners have access to people and resources that most churches will never tap into. It's because businesses have a different market, a different marketing strategy. But I tell you, it works. And if you could put Jesus in that, it really works. Throughout all human history, recorded in the Bible, God has done some amazing accomplishments through the workforce. Abraham, the father of nations, was a businessman. Isaac and Jacob were as well. Joseph was a grain administrator. Moses was at work when he encountered God. Elijah was a field plower. Amos was a sheep breeder and a tender of the sycamore trees. Daniel was a government official. Do you hear that? Even the government could work in your favor if you put God in it. That's right. Jesus was a carpenter and the son of a carpenter. I was a carpenter. It's a great profession. Most of the disciples were fishermen and other businessmen, and Zacchaeus was a tax collector. Even those guys got a chance. It shows that the business world is important to God and that the business market is very important to God. Whether you're the employee, the supervisor, the owner, the client, the salesman, or the consumer, or the observer, God can turn your job and your business and your community into a place of heaven on earth. But only if you allow those around you to experience God through you. That's why we're here today, to learn how to take what God has given us, to take it out there, to make it to where the world could be a better place, all right? One reason God chooses business, businessmen is because they're not intimidated by the world. They've already made a leap of faith to get out there and literally have to sell themselves. They're marketing themselves. Nobody's buying stuff from people they don't like. But if you can market yourself and then also market Jesus or market Jesus through yourself, man, you got a great business plan. They're already open-minded and openly expressing interactions. The public is an env environment of welcome challenge. The Bible says go into the highways and the, by and the byways. That means it didn't say go into the building. Go to the building for training, yes. But from there, you go into the highways and by byways. Go to the lost. And since they're not in a specific location, they must be sought out. There are some people at your work or at a store or at a park or at a public building that will never come to God. But, they give, but God has given you the opportunity to go see them. And when they see you, can they see the reason to come see him? That's what we're left with. I think it's important to send missionaries and that we pray over them. But maybe we should do the same when we send somebody to Walmart. I'm just saying, why are we not praying over that? Why are we not saying, hey, you know what? Me and my family, we're going to go to Walmart today. God, help us go in there with an attitude that somebody sees you and us. Let us reach somebody today. I've experienced a lot of times I've got on my knees at Walmart and prayed with people in a wheelchair. I've got, I've got in the aisles with the groceries and prayed over some people. We've had some of the best church at Walmart. Really. Because church is where you take it. Let me tell you about this story real quick. Chad and I was out. We're doing like what we normally do, walking around Lowe's. I'm just really dragging Chad behind me because I done forgot why we went there. 
which happened all the time, didn't it, Chad? All the time. I'd be like, we got to go for this. And we get in there. And when I leave, Chad, why didn't you tell me? What? Well, I don't know. <laughs> We'd both forget. But when I'm walking around Lowe's, I don't know why, but I just, I'll, I'll purposely look for people that don't look like they know what they're doing. And we've seen this woman that was getting this piece of plywood. And uh, she goes to check it out. And I'm, I'm watching her. And she goes to try to put this full sheet of plywood in a van. And it ain't going. And she got these two older women, or not older, but two, two ladies trying to pull this plywood in a van. No, it ain't going to work. So we went over to her and I said, hey, um, you, you taking that plywood somewhere here local? She said, yeah. Why? I said, well, I have a truck. And I'm working local, too. So if you need me to, I could drop that wood off for you. And she said, well, really? Well, we're over here at such and such. I was like, well, good. We're only working right down the road. I don't mind dropping it off. And then she looks at me kind of like, well, maybe you might steal this if I bought it. <laughs> you know? So I said, I said, hey, I tell you what, uh, I'll, I'll follow you over there. If you want me to, or you give me an address, I'll go there first. So me and Chad, we go over and we deliver this wood. And it was, it was great. We're just talking and uh, talking to this woman dropping off. She's like super appreciative that I even gave it to her. And uh, so me and Chad, we had that, hey, we did a good, good, good thing today, you know. And we get ready to leave, and that woman blew us away. She said, you mind if I pray for you guys? Dude, I can't help but cry thinking about it. That woman prayed better than anybody I've ever heard pray in my life. And I'm talking about she took time, John, to pray from my head and going all the way down to my body, all the way to my feet, and was on her hands and knees praying over my feet. And I'm sitting there just bawling. I don't even know what to do. Then she turns around, grabs Chad, does the same thing. If you will allow people to experience God in the workforce, in the marketplace, even at Lowe's, God could bless you in ways you've never seen before. Never seen. I've never been prayed like that. It's just amazing. Changed my life forever. Me and, me and Chad left there. We was just a blubbering, sobbing mess. Didn't know how, I mean, it's crazy. I, I don't even know if I could see to drive. We just took off. <laughs> it's just crazy. But I'm telling you, she was amazing. Amazing. And her name is Bonnie Mims, by the way. An amazing Tracy sister, and she is a prayer warrior, and she taught me a lot about intercession, a lot about it. Sometimes you're in the marketplace and on the job or out in the public so that people can see you to try to see God in you. There's always somebody watching you, always. And I want to tell you, a lot of us go out there with our Christian T-shirts, and people are looking to see if that billboard matches up with your action. If you say, I know Jesus, but your actions don't line up with it, they're questioning you. There are other times that you're in the right place at the right time just for someone else. And there's sometimes you're at the right place and the right time for you. But you don't know when that is. So you just got to be the right person all the time. All the time. I believe God can use all of us wherever we go. Wherever we're at. And especially in the workforce so we can get them in these doors. So they could learn how to be able to be sent out. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and give you a hope for your future. For more information about our church, visit us at ourjourney.tv. We look forward to doing life with you. Now, let's go this week and be the church in our community as we focus on loving God and loving others. See you next week.